invite you for a stroll down graveyard lane where beauty and love abide and in death we are born to eternal life all monuments from the simplest effort stand erect on the closed books of the lives of our beloved departed and each marker withholds many stories, some filled with happiness, some filled with sorrow. I wonder, what would they do if they had the chance to relive their lives again? What would you do? Now, 
want us, you and I, go for a stroll, huh? I'm sorry, Puma. I didn't mean to step on you. Puma? Puma! Puma! Puma? Puma? Puma! Where are you? Don't be afraid. There, Puma. Come to Rieger, Puma. I'm sorry I hurt you. I didn't mean to step on you. Lewis B. Moffat. February 3rd, 1933. November 17, 1955. I feared not. <laughs> I remember him. I remember. Lewis B. Moffat. <laughs> first lecture in dissection. It's any day now. You're in for quite a treat. Professor Rayburn is a terrific cut-up. Say, how's your stomach, Lou? Physically, I'm fine, but technically, well, that's another story. I gotta keep hitting the books. Betty might be at the cafeteria. Ah, oh, come on, let's leave. Let's go, fellas. I'm stuck. I hope the hamburger is good tonight. We parked on the drive, and the first thing he did was turn the car light on. Aw. Then he opened the glove compartment, took out some paper, and read me seven chapters from a book he's writing. What's the name of the book? Oh, that I remember. He called it The Beat Evolution. Alice, are you sure there were no calls on it? The phone hasn't rung even once. Has it, Bunny? Not even once. Gee, that's funny. When Lewis says he'll call, he's always right on the dot. I wonder if anything's wrong. Are you kidding? Nothing will ever happen to that one. Why not? He's just like any other human being. Is he? Not from what I hear. What do you hear, Alice? Well, Jerry says he's got nerves that won't quit. My boyfriend, Seymour, says he likes him. Alice, you were saying something. I sure wish you'd finish. I'm starting to think he's a little on the envelope, right? That's all. Well, you might not if you understood him. Do you understand him? I think I do. Well, pretty well, anyway. I always get the feeling that there's a fight going on inside of him. I can't quite explain it to you, but it's like there were two people inside of him, two separate personalities trying to gain control. I know I'm not putting it right. But I know how I feel when I'm with him. Betty, I think you're in love with the man. I could be, if it weren't for one thing. What's that? Nothing seems to shake him. He's not afraid of anything. It might hurt him someday. What do you think? Oh, he could go crazy trying to figure the answer to that one. I'm going to call him. Well, it's going to start getting pretty sticky in here in a few minutes. I'm going over to Jenny's room. See you in the cafeteria. Hello? This is Louis Moffat. Betty, I missed you at the cafeteria. I was at the hairdresser's. Oh? On account of our date? What else? 
<laughs> well, you're going to be the slickest chick at that ever loving hop. What are you doing? I'm waiting for you to ask me what I'm doing. <laughs> well, the gang have gone down to the cafeteria. Would you like to join them? I'll pick you up. Now, that's what I call service. Send Mr. Moffat's car around to the door, James. Jets on this heap. My launching pad is only three blocks away, remember? Yeah. Let's continue to the moon. To the moon. Can't we spend a quiet evening like alone? Well, we're expecting Professor Rayburn to notify us. The fellas ought to all be together in case he does. You know, the autopsy is being conducted at City Morgue, and John Doe's don't grow on slabs every day. We wouldn't be gone long. Okay. We go for a short drive, moonlight, and then to the cafeteria. You're so romantic. Know your blossoms. Aren't they lovely? I wish you were studying law or architecture or engineering or anything except medicine. But, darling... Well, just because your father was a doctor doesn't mean you have to carry on with a life that was set by someone else. Betty, we've been over all that before. I'm studying medicine not because Dad was a doctor, but because, well, I feel I have the qualifications that'll make a good doctor. For instance, I'm not afraid of any of it. I'm not afraid of the blood or the corpses or, or the operations. And things like that are important for a doctor to do his duties well. I'm sorry, Betty, if, if you're not interested in all that. It's my fault, darling. I'll never bring up the subject again. Are you all right, Betty? I'm all right, Louis. You're not afraid of anything. Not anything.
sodas would you like the best? Oh, honey, tell I enjoy them all. I'd like to try a raspberry. You'll have another one with me? <laughs> I shouldn't. <laughs> all right. Hey, Howard, come here a minute, will you? What is it, Tiny? Uh, bring my doll another soda. Make it raspberry, will you? Hey, make it two. Two raspberry sodas. For the last of the big time spenders. What she sees in him, I'll never know. She's beautiful and smart, too. Yeah, she's very devoted to him. Doesn't play the field, like some girls I know. She coming to the hop tomorrow night? Yeah, with Lewis. He won't be there. Not if the autopsy's for tomorrow night. Him and 15 other guys. All of you will be dancing with tears in your eyes. Because the boy in your arms is a girl. You doctors to be always spoil our social life with your all-night study routine. Yeah, all part of a doctor's training, getting used to the irregular hours of a doctor's life. Oh, here they come now. Gee, she looks like she's just seen a ghost. Hi, gang, what's new? Hi, Hi. 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 Tell me you took her to the morgue to look at all the dead bodies. <laughs> I just had a rendezvous with the rattlesnake. It crawled into the car while we were parked. But Lewis killed it. Gee, no wonder she's pale. I'd have fainted. Lou, I saw Professor Rayburn on the way down. He said the coroner might have a stiff ready for us by tomorrow night. Hey, that's great. Yeah, as soon as the city coroner confirms it, he'll let us know the exact time. Well, this autopsy begins our careers in medicine. And anyway, maybe it won't happen tomorrow night. <laughs> hey! Oh, boy, does that look crazy. And here's your check. Check. Hey, is this a price? Or is that your telephone number? <laughs> uh, you'll have to do better than that, Tiny. I heard that one about five years ago. It was a joke about my Q-tips then. Come on, let's see. This is great. Saccharin tablets. Hope to keep the weight down. I gotta make that fraternity. <laughs> hey, you know what? I heard that music is a real fine form of exercise. Especially dancing to it, too. You wanna? Sure! Come on. They're going to provide a lot of kicks this year, Howard. What do you got cooked up for the initiation? Well, the radiology class has some new routines worked out for the budding medics. I hope the boys can take it. I hear they got hold of some stunts tried out at Yale and Cornell. Not to mention jolly old Oxford. <laughs> they even have one from the University of Naples, which dates way, way back. Berlinopoly. So what do you got, a Faisan? Well, to tell you the truth, it's pretty gruesome. I don't know whether the fellows are going to be able to take it or not. Sounds terrific. Hey, what gives? Uh-uh, buddy. Not a meeting. 
Besides, we can't give the pledges out their routines until after I see how they make out in their first autopsy, which I think will be tonight. Jason, Jason, bring the bass. <laughs> Professor Rayburn. Hello, Moffat. Professor Rayburn, may I ask a favor of you? Why, certainly. What is it? Well, I understand that you use a student to assist you at your autopsies. Yes, but that shouldn't concern you. I usually pick seniors. Well, I was wondering if, if I might help you. That's odd. Most of the fellows try to dodge it. They give me all kinds of lame duck excuses, uh, from heart condition to athlete's foot. Well, I think it'd be very interesting, and... Well, may I, sir? Well, all right. <laughs> I tell you what you do. You, uh, you go by the morgue just before class and uh, slip into a surgical gown. And uh, I'll give you your instructions. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it, sir. <laughs> yeah. cannot overcome certain inner emotions. 
And when we do an autopsy of this kind, let me say to you to feel free to leave the class if you should feel nauseous. It is sometimes difficult for us to accustom ourselves to uh, the callousness of what is to follow. Mr. Moffat, will you roll in Mr. John Doe, please? John Doe left this world with one possession on him, a gold ring. We shall begin with a pectoral incision. We have now exposed the gastrovascular cavity. We have cut through the epidermis, and you see this yellow mass, that's the fatty tissue. It reminds you of chicken fat. Proceed to the right and locate the duodenum. Now, gentlemen, please pay close attention. I'm about to show you some of the striata and some of the non-striata muscles. Now, this is most important in the human body. to notice all the fleshy tissue up around the chest. This man must have led a very full and active life. Perhaps he was a carpenter or a bricklayer, but his muscle structure up in his chest is just fantastic. You notice all the tissue in here. You see that? Now, another indication. Another indication, gentlemen. When you look at the duat down here on the right. You find, oh, all kinds of little things. They look like, you know, chicken eggs sometimes. Except a chicken egg with a broken blood vessel in it, you might say. It's a kind of a dark, uh, bloody man. Well, it's not very pleasant to look at, I must admit. But it's most important to the human anatomy. Very important indeed. As we look in the upper chest cavity, you will notice something that is most important. The aorta. The aorta is the... Now, gentlemen, you have just seen your first medical dissection. Mr. John Doe has rendered posthumously 
a great service to medical science. Tomorrow he will be transferred to the general mausoleum of the Raven Hill Cemetery, where he will be stored for about a week in the receiving vault. After that week, he will probably be buried there in Potter's Field. Uh, Mr. Mars, you may escort Mr. John Doe to his drawer. just thinking. Do you have to do it staring at me? You know, every time you have a nightmare, you always say the same words. Don't turn off the light. What are you doing now? Taking notes? What does it mean, anyway? Ask a psychiatrist. But don't get touchy. Well, how do you think it feels to wake up and find some guy staring at you? I don't mean to bug you about it. It's the same nightmare I've been having ever since I was a kid. It's got some meaning, I guess, but I don't know what it is. Maybe I've been around too many dead bodies. Look, if it annoys you, I can move to another room. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. I just, well, you know, I just wondered. Don't you ever have nightmares? After that autopsy, I'll probably have plenty of them. Look, it's ten minutes after four. Let's get some sleep, huh? Initiation night. When are we going to get our initiation assignments? The orders will be handed to us in sealed envelopes at 11 p.m. after the barbecue. That ought to be a ball. <laughs> For whom? I hear some pretty gruesome story. After that autopsy, what could be so tough? Oh, that's where I came in. Hey, you're the only guy that didn't seem to mind it. Mr. Moffat, you may escort Mr. John Doe in. Say, I know what your initiation assignment should be. Say, if you're thinking what I'm thinking. Don't say it. We'll suggest it to the senior committee. Well, I'm game. Just so long as I make the fraternity. Hey, we're going to be late for class. Let's go. I'll see, see you. Later. Boy, if they only knew what they're in for. <laughs> Comes the dawn. 
brother. Hello, Bob. Oh, hi, Martha. Say, you handled yourself like an old pro at the dissection last night. How much nerve does it take to push a cart around? One with a dead body on it? You're trying to make it sound like a big deal. Hey, what's the story on you anyway, Martha? I don't know what you mean. I mean, what are you trying to prove? And what makes you think I'm trying to prove anything? Eh, you're playing it bold and fearless these days. For some reason, too. Why? To impress the fraternity committee? Hey, look. I've been looking all over for you. You found me. You know Wayne Arnold? Yeah. He was killed last night. You're what? not kidding. Driving that hopped-up car of his. Slammed right into a truck. They said he was going over 100 miles an hour when it happened. I'm going over to the funeral parlor tonight, and I wondered if you wanted to come along. Gee, I'd like to, but I better hit the books. What's the matter? Scared, Moffat? You know, as a matter of fact, I can make it. After dinner, okay? Sure. Well, I better cut out. I'll see you then. So long, Bob. So long, Steve. forbid him to touch any liquids all day long, not a drop, mind you. And then at the barbecue, we let him have all the liquid he wants. You mean give him the works at Silver Lake Fountain? Great. Uh, Tom Neely. Oh, yeah. The homely boy in the chemistry class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another great idea. Got it? Now, we all know how these shindigs come out, don't we? Sooner or later, every boy and girl disappears into the shrubs. <laughs> Why not have Neely now? Get this. Okay. And have Neely dressed as Cupid. 
flashlight, bow and arrow, the whole works. Have him search through the shrubs and kiss every girl right in front of her date. <laughs> yeah. Be sure he wears his glasses for self-protection. Okay, now, Louis Moffat. Louis Moffat. Hey, Clark, where have you been? All of the assignments are made except one. Except Louis Moffat's. We've got a great idea, and it fits him to a team. It's terrific. Go on, tell him. Listen to this, fellas. It's good. Well, at the autopsy, Moffat acted as if he'd played around with corpses all of his life. The entire procedure didn't bother him a bit. A galvanized stomach, huh? Professor Rayburn said that John Doe's body would be transferred to the Raven Hill General Mausoleum after the autopsy. Now, tomorrow night, after the barbecue, Moffat would be given... Me. No, I won't excuse you. I'm going to talk to you and you're going to listen. I don't care about anything you have to say. Will you please get out? Not until you listen to me. Okay. But make it short, will you? First of all, why are you sore? You don't know? Well, I imagine it's about leaving you at the dance, isn't it? You know perfectly well, Wendy. I think that's a mighty thin reason. You know we had to make that lecture or flunk out automatically. We had no say in it. I know that. Then why are you mad? I guess you really don't know. Well, I'd certainly like to find out, if you don't mind telling me. It isn't just the dance, Lewis. It's the way you've been acting. Oh? You've been acting like some sort of Superman. At least that's what they say. They? They say you've been showing how fearless you are by wheeling dead bodies into classrooms. They say you've been acting like an oddball. They say you won't even let them like you. They again. You know what I think about they every time I hear that word? I think of some big, gray, shapeless monster with a million faces and a million voices. And when you look close, nothing at all. If you listen to they, Betty, you'll be running around in circles all your life. It's you that I care about, not they, what they say, what they think. How do you feel? I don't know. How would you feel if you heard strange things about me? Well, I wouldn't stop talking to you until I found out whether it was true or not. I wouldn't let they make any decisions for me. Miss Milford. Miss Ragdoll Milford. Who? Uh, he, he, uh, he means the, uh, the, the, the large one. And he's kidding. He's got to be. You are kidding, aren't you, young man? No, sir. To me, she's lovely. Well, I'd hope we could make a unanimous decision, but that's your choice. Yes, sir. And, you know, I think you both ought to vote for her, too. Oh, you do. Why? Well, so I've been told Miss Milford has heart and spirit and 
soul and generosity and kindness, too. We are selecting the winner of a beauty contest, not a den mother. Oh. Well, if you're only interested in superficial values, surface qualities... Oh, well, even speaking of surface qualities, just look at the... That'll do. Oh. I think we've reached a majority decision. Uh, you'll make the announcement, Professor Rayburn. I'll be glad to. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to announce that the judges have reached a unanimous, a, a majority decision. It is my pleasure to announce the Queen of the Bacchanalian Festival as Miss Alice Lund. can have all you want. Uh, I'm so thirsty, it seems like I've been without water for a, for a month instead of just a day. All right, all right. Hey, fellas, His Highness craves to sup of yon nectar. Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a tall, refreshing goblet of Coke nectar. <laughs> well, Bacchus, didst thou get thy fill? It's coming out of his team. <laughs> well, did you spot any lovers? Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid I did. Oh. <laughs> but I'm not giving up so easy. I'm going to put this assignment on a paying basis. <laughs> Oh, honey, you're for me. What about tomorrow? Tommy, I 
Oh, I almost made 36 inches. See? Hey, you did pretty well, Tiny, considering. You mean I'm in? I'm a brother? Well, not quite. What do you mean? Uh, here's your assignment. Let's see. Tiny, for the next seven days, you will forego all food, whatever, with the exception of bread and water at three regular intervals a day. Oh, no, that's too much. I quit. Here, you can have my saccharine bottle and take back your assignment. I don't want to be anybody's brother that bad. Besides, they already got me a brother. And I got a sister, too. I'm going to go find Ragdoll, because she likes me just the way I am. Now, wait a minute, Tiny. Wait a minute. What do you want? You passed. Yeah? I was just kidding you. You passed your initiation. You won them. Yeah? Didn't have the heart to, to keep you worrying about it. Oh, you mean I'm a brother? Oh, boy. Wait till I tell Ragdoll. It's almost 11.30. My assignment. May I read it? Sorry, darling. Against the rules. You shall go to Raven Hill Cemetery. Enter the General Mausoleum. In aisle 3, crypt 18, you will find the remains of autopsy John Doe. On his right angular finger, you'll find a gold ring, which you must deliver to the president of the Senior Initiation Committee upon your return to the campus. The Senior Committee will later make proper restitution through the caretaker of Raven Hill. What's wrong, Lewis? You're not scared, are you? You are. For the first time in your life, you're really scared. Don't be silly. There's nothing to it. I've got to go. Please be careful, darling. I'll see you when I get back. should be back any minute. Where'd he go? On his assignment. Hey, what about you? Did you finish yours? Yes, I asked everyone who lives on Howard Street for a penny. And? I got 23 cents. 23 cents? You were gone four and a half hours and all you got is 23 cents? It must be the recession. Say, what kind of an assignment did Lou get? Well, he'll tell you. If he's able to tell you when he gets back. You know, I heard you guys gave an assignment that dates back to the 15th century. <laughs> About that time. Is that the one Lou got? Hey, why all the curiosity? Oh, I just wondered if Lou's assignment was as weird as mine. Weird? Yeah, I guess that is the word for it. Weird.
Louis B. Moffat. I feared not. <laughs> Yet fear dwells within all of us, young and old alike. Has terrifying fear ever gripped your heart? Mm -hmm.